All right. Um, so I've just given you the syllabus. Let's go over a few things on the syllabus really quickly, and then we're going to get into some material today. Um, since we only meet once a week, that means we have to try and make the most out of our class meetings. And one of the tricky things is that your assignments are going to be due during the next class meeting. And so I'll give you a homework assignment uh, today, and then we won't see each other again uh, until it's due, unless you come by my office hours or, uh, you know, I'm always um, anxious to help you out via email if you have questions that way. Uh, but this is hydrology and drainage control. I was looking over the class list before um, uh, before today, and I noticed there's both some environmental science and environmental engineering students in here, and that's great. I'm glad to have the variety of backgrounds. I'm just curious, how many of you have taken a class in uh, hydraulic design before? You know, so where you've learned maybe Manning's equation or open channel flow. Anybody with background in hydraulic design? Just the one. Okay, that's good too. Um, so today we'll maybe feel a little bit more engineering intensive than some of the rest of the lectures will be. So if we start going into equations and it seems uh, like it's going to be too much engineering for you, don't panic right off the bat. Um, I think overall the course is kind of about 50-50 balanced on uh, engineering science and engineering design. And so we'll be getting into a lot of the fundamentals of hydrology, as well as I'm trying to uh, leave you with some uh, practical tools that you can use to do uh, drainage design. Um, so this table on the first page of the, uh, page of the syllabus has uh, my contact details. You know, my office is up on the third floor of this building. My phone and email are listed there. And uh, my office hours are... Uh, Tuesday and Thursday, as you can see, and then Wednesday before this class. Uh, but I'm uh, willing and glad to meet with you outside of my office hours if I happen to be available. Uh, you can always pass by and see if I'm there or send me an email and we can set an appointment if these office hour times don't work for you. There's a long list of university policies here that kind of govern the academic experience at Marshall, and we won't go through each of these in detail. but. Um, at some point in your academic career, you maybe should go through these and see if there's anything uh, that applies to you. Um, the first thing I want to specifically point out is our textbook. And I see uh, at least one of you already has a copy of the book, um, Water Resources Engineering by Mays. It's available in the bookstore, and I think it's also widely available online. I'm just curious, where did you get it? Uh, bookstore. Bookstore. And uh, what were they charging for it? They had like several options. You get new, uh, used, or rental. Right. They did it used okay. and uh, good condition. But I mean, I ordered by like three days ago and it came in right away. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so the textbook is important, and I'm going to hand out a, uh, a list of terminology and important concepts that uh, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with during the semester. And so I'll also, um, when we begin each lecture, point out which sections of the book the material that we're covering in class corresponds to. And so it's expected for you to read the corresponding textbook sections um, because it reinforces the uh, message in a way, just like a different method of explaining it so that I think uh, maybe the concepts will be easier to grasp if you get two different ways of it being explained to you. Uh, there are some course requirements here related to attendance and classroom behavior, uh, computer expectations, the fact that occasionally our lectures may be delivered online rather than an in-person meeting. And when that's the case, I'll send you an announcement in advance. Um, the maybe I think all of these are pretty ordinary, but the one thing I will point out is that the assignments that you submit this semester need to be turned in electronically. And I'll give you a demo in a minute on some software that I think is pretty useful for that called Cam Scanner. It's just an app that you can put on your phone and you take a picture of the paper and it creates a PDF. So I'll show you how to use that in just a minute. Uh, but that's uh, the electronic submission of the assignments just makes it so that we don't have to shuffle papers back and forth and I can give you feedback on your assignments much more quickly than you having to wait the next week till we meet again. You know, if, the assignment is due at 4 o'clock on Wednesday, then on Thursday sometime I can grade the assignment and you instantly have your grades and your feedback. 
rather than having to wait till the next week. If you turn to the second page, you'll notice that the, uh, the grading scheme is listed here, uh, the breakdown of points from the assignments, quizzes, exams, and we'll have a relatively modest project in the course, as well as the uh, percentages that correspond to letter grades. Um, the, uh, the underlined material here under assignments is um, maybe the policy I need to point out because I'm a little bit more strict than some instructors in that I don't accept any late work uh, unless you have a university excused absence. And those university excused absences are usually limited to situations where maybe you're hospitalized or too sick to come into uh, to school or have a close family member with one of those uh, situations. Um, I do drop the one lowest homework grade of the semester kind of to balance out those expectations that every assignment be submitted online. And so if you happen to uh, just miss the deadline on one of the homeworks or you're really busy at work and can't get around to it, you can still maintain a perfect score in the assignments category because I drop uh, the lowest score of the semester. Uh, here under the academic dishonesty policy, I go into my expectations that every assignment and quiz and exam and uh, everything that you submit for projects has to be your own work, that I think it's good for you to discuss assignments with other classmates uh, and maybe even help each other find mistakes, but I think it's a mistake to sit together and work through every step of the problem at the same time. Uh, because inevitably when that happens it seems like whoever would naturally be working a little bit faster uh, does that and the person who would naturally work a little bit more slowly kind of just mimics the solution that the other person was going to do and then that naturally slower person who maybe they would have uh, figured everything out on their own and had a good learning experience it's kind of like they're robbed of the opportunity to go through it and uh, and for those concepts to sink in. So I differentiate between acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior there, but the, uh, the bottom line expectation is that everything you turn in should be your work. Uh, I know that in, for most textbooks these days, you could find the author's solution manual online if you look hard enough, uh, but I really would discourage you from using that and require that you don't on the assignments that you turn in. Um, so, are there any questions about the syllabus so far, or the course policies? Okay, page three is just a list of our course outcomes, and from that table you can get an idea of what we hope to achieve this semester, like at the end of the semester, what you should be able to do, and, uh, and then the third and uh, the second and third column on that table is just how you'll practice each of those skills and then how you're going to be tested on it, like in, in which assessment. Uh, the last page is an overview of the entire course. It includes which topics we'll discuss during each of our class meetings, uh, the book chapter that corresponds to the topics we'll cover. You can see on the schedule when the uh, two exams are going to be. Our midterm exam will be on March 6th. Our our uh, final exam will be on Wednesday, Wednesday, May 8th. And then uh, in the last column you can see when each of the homework assignments for the semester is going to be due, as well as the project. So you're coming in, so the midterm exams will be on the... Yeah, so you can see here it's uh, March 6th, yes. exam one, mm -hmm. and then the final exam is May 8th, Wednesday, May 8th, at the very bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah. We just have one midterm exam and then the final exam. Are there any other questions about the uh, syllabus, schedule, course policies? All right, I already mentioned the uh, key concepts. So let me give you that paper. Uh, this is a list of things that you should be able to give a short answer about by the end of the semester. And so our final exam and our midterm exam will have two parts. There will be, in the first part of the exam, concept questions where you are um, basically explaining different principles and uh, defining terms. And then the second part of the exam will be uh, focusing on problem solving. And uh, in the first part of the exam, you have to work that entirely by memory. 
And so this is a list of the topics that you should be able to define and explain from memory. Uh, whereas on the second part of the exam, the problem solving, you can use an equation packet and, and other resources to help you solve the assignment. Okay, one more handout for today. Uh, I printed the notes for you for today's lecture. Please feel free to interrupt at any time. You know, we've only got a very small enrollment, so I'm hoping this class can be like a comfortable environment. Nobody should feel like intimidated or that they can't ask for a clarification. All right. I wanted to start off our semester with this diagram because uh, it kind of, in a single image, captures a lot of the principles that we're going to be addressing this semester. And it's a summary of the water cycle. And I'm sure some of you have taken watershed courses in the past. Um, from the engineering perspective, what we're uh, particularly interested in in the water cycle is the amount of water and its timing. And so you can see here that uh, precipitation, which it just doesn't come from nowhere, it comes from evaporation of water and free surfaces, transpo evaporation from plants, evaporation from the ocean. So precipitation um, we'll study from the perspective of both what causes precipitation, how do we measure it, and um, and what are some of the effects of precipitation. Uh, you can see here that infiltration is illustrated and that's the amount of water that percolates into the soil. And so in one of our class lectures we're going to look at a couple of different empirical models that describe how much water makes it down under the surface versus how much of the water is going to uh, exist as runoff. And so the, the difference between precipitation and infiltration is how much runs over the surface of the land. And that's what is most interesting to uh, engineering and hydraulic designers because the amount of water that's flowing through streams and channels has to be accommodated. And so we design the size of the channel. We may have to design uh, a bridge to accommodate the water going through a channel. We'll talk today about culverts and how large a culvert needs to be is in large part a reflection of hydrology. So I think this, uh, this picture is kind of a worthy starting point of the semester. And the big question that we'll address, everything can kind of be uh, put down under the umbrella of, for a certain area of interest, what are the runoff characteristics? And so going back to this picture, the runoff characteristics that we're talking about is the amount of water and when it's, when it's arriving at certain locations. And so how much water is going through the stream, how much water is going through the pipe. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm asking, are you recording this lecture? Yes, this lecture is being recorded. And it's already on the blackboard. Um, I'm going to post it on YouTube and I'll give you a link to the uh, YouTube channel on MU Online. Thank you. Yeah. So, what we want to know is for a certain watershed, what are the characteristics of the runoff? Like how much runoff is there going to be? And uh, what will be its peak intensity? So that depends on rainfall. It depends on infiltration into the soil. And all of these sub-factors are considerations that we're going to have to quantify. The amount of runoff depends on abstractions. And what abstractions means is the amount of water that's lost in a watershed due to evaporation, um, interception, which is the process of rain wetting the surface of trees and buildings, and um, surface wetting of things like pavements and small pond areas and puddles that have to be satisfied before there will be any runoff. And so each of these will be a major focus of our lectures and at the same time, there are models that have been developed over time that can tell us amounts. You know, 
uh, for a certain location, how much rainfall will you expect to see? West Virginia versus Seattle has very different rainfall characteristics. And Seattle versus Los Angeles has very different rainfall characteristics. And so we're going to talk about why different locations experience different rainfall and then what are the implications of that. Different types of soil have different infiltration characteristics. What's uh, the predominant soil type here in West Virginia? Clay. It's clay, which is a very poor soil when it comes to uh, permeability of, of rainfall. And so the infiltration is, is generally very slow through clay. And as a consequence, that's one of the factors that contributes to a problematic flooding here in West Virginia. The fact that it's very steep, and so the water moves quickly over the surface. And then the other contributing factor is that we have lots of rocks and clay in the watershed, and they just don't absorb water very effectively. And so there are other places where the predominant soil type is sand, and sand allows for a lot faster infiltration than clay does. And so from location to location, you have to know a bit about what's underneath the ground to predict what the runoff is going to be. Now, once we have a characterization of these general principles, what we want to do is somehow turn it into what's called a hydrograph. And a hydrograph is a figure that summarizes when the flow is going to arrive. And so on one axis it has time, and on the other axis it has flow rate. And a hydrograph says that there's going to be a certain peak flow rate that occurs at a certain time. And this is what we want to know because it's the peak flow rate that we have to size all the downstream infrastructure for. We want to make the pipe big enough so that biggest flow rate that's coming out of the watershed can be accommodated. We're not so worried about what the other flow rates are below that peak flow rate unless we're sizing maybe a pond or we're looking at issues related to water supply. But when, when it comes to pipe and culvert sizing, and when it comes to evaluating how a channel is going to behave and whether a property you own next to a creek is going to flood, uh, the most important question that you can answer is, what's the peak flow rate for a certain storm? Every 10 years, a certain storm is going to come through. They, they, they talk about these storms in terms of statistical probability and return period. And so, you know, how big will be that storm that comes through every year? And how high will the creek level be? We're going to learn some computer models that allow you to predict that. Uh, we'll be learning this semester a uh, hydrologic model uh, called HEC-1. And we run that HEC-1 model and, and others using a preprocessor called WMS, which is really a convenient way to go out and get GIS data that tells you about the soil and about the precipitation. And then uh, once we know the flow rate, we're going to uh, learn some tools that allows you to, to know how deep will the water be in a channel. We're going to use HECRAS. And um, uh, today we're going to uh, get into HY8, which is a culvert assessment program. So the idea is when you know about the environment, when you know about the rain, when you know about the soil, then you can predict how much runoff there's going to be, how much water comes through the creek during a certain storm. Routing is a word that describes the timing of the water and uh, whether there will be a long delay between when the rainfall begins and when you see the peak or whether those two events are relatively quick. Um, here in West Virginia, they often describe our watersheds as being flashy, which means that there's a very short time period between when the rain starts and when the peak flow can arrive. And it's, again, because of the steep watersheds and the fact that there's very little infiltration. But some larger watersheds or watersheds where the ground isn't quite so steep, uh, the flow characteristics aren't as flashy, which means that there's a long delay between when it rains and when the peak is seen. I've already kind of touched on this, that why we care about all of these factors is because engineers design things. We decide how big does the stream need to be, how wide should a channel be to accommodate the flow, how big should the pipe be. 
And so we're going to look at issues related to both hydraulic sizing, but then also the management of floodplains. You maybe have seen, if you drive around in West Virginia, sometimes you can see that people will dump like construction debris or bricks or extra soil uh, into the creek area. And they're doing that because they want more flat land to uh, maybe not build on, but you know, park cars on or just there's a shortage of flat area and uh, in, in where I live out in Ona, there's a few people that are putting soil into the floodplain so that you know, they'll have more flat land to build on. But later in the semester, we're going to talk about why that increases the risk of flooding for everybody else that lives in the floodplain. That when you are filling in the floodway, it effectively, it's like dropping uh, bricks into a bathtub. It raises the water level. So we'll, we'll go over that towards the end of the semester. So any questions about this kind of conceptual map of the big idea in this course? OK. Um, at the beginning of each of the lectures, I'm going to give an announcement slide that looks like this, that kind of summarizes uh, what we're up to today and also what needs to be on your radar for the uh, coming courses, uh, for the coming classes. And uh, you can see that I mentioned in the announcements there that your first homework assignment is due a week from today. So let me give you a copy of that. It's also on MU Online, the PDF version of it. Uh, so you need to upload your assignment to MU Online before class on Wednesday the 23rd. And so at 4 p.m. it just kind of vanishes and it's invisible uh, next Wednesday. We've already gone over the syllabus and schedule. Let me give you a quick demo on cam scanner. I don't mind if you get your phone out. I mean, generally, I don't like you playing with your phone. But right now, if you want to install cam scanner, it's available on both Android and, uh, and the iPhone App Store cam scanner. And uh, what it allows you to do is you can just basically start up the program and take a picture of a piece of paper. Let me start a new document here. Um, it has a camera app when you start the program, a camera symbol. And uh, if you just take a picture of a document, what's kind of nice about it is it automatically recognizes where is the border of that document. So it trims out the extraneous and it kind of corrects and straightens the image. And so you do like the check mark when it, if it automatically detects the edges correctly. And then across the bottom, it gives you the option of color, grayscale, black and white. And this is really important. You should always scan in black and white. I'm going to write this up here to make it uh, to emphasize. Scan in black and white. And the reason why that is not only are the file sizes smaller, but it increases the clarity of the image. You know, the contrast is a lot better. So you may need to scroll to the side to get black and white, but then you do a check mark again. And it automatically uploads this document to the cloud. You'll, you can create like a, uh, an account so that now if you want to, uh, to upload that file to MU Online, you can go to the Cam Scanner website to get it. So let me show you what this picture I just took is going to look like. The uh, documents are in reverse chronological order, so the newest at the top, you can see this is the uh, 16th at 427, so that's the one that I just barely took the picture of. And then uh, you can zoom in on it, just make sure it looks okay, and then download in either PDF or JPEG. And so you can select PDF and then make sure that you're saving it to a location you're going to be able to find later on. You know, if it's my documents or maybe you're creating a certain folder for the course. So uh, it does a pretty good job. I have kind of a cheap camera on my phone. I don't have a very nice phone. But it still tapes perfectly acceptable PDFs. You know, this is good enough for me being able to see your work when I grade the assignments. And, uh, you know, if you had multiple papers that you were working on, it's just you take pictures and it builds them all into a continuous single PDF file. So 
That's cam scanner, and you'll use that to make the PDF that you submit here to uh, MU Online. So you can see under our course page, here's homework one. If you click on homework one, then it brings up this uh, submission. And so you can attach multiple files. And I think on this first assignment, um, you'll do some of the calculations by hand. And there may also be uh, some cases where you're like taking screenshots of the software that you're working. And, and so if you're taking screenshots from the software, then you can just paste those screenshots into Word. And so uh, you can upload the uh, PDF file of your hand calculations and then any other supporting files, you know, whether it's a spreadsheet, Excel, or it's a Word document. You can just upload all of the files here and then make sure you click Submit. Um, if you accidentally forget something, you can go back in and submit it again up until the deadline. And so I've set up the uh, gradebook to allow for multiple submissions. Um, any questions about CAM Scanner or about how the uh, assignments will be submitted this semester? If you run into any trouble, let me know. But uh, it seems to have worked pretty good. I've been doing this electronic submission for the last couple of years, and it speeds things up for us. All right, well, let's talk about flumes. A uh, flume is a device that's used for measuring flow. And uh, in a river or a canal, sometimes it's not obvious just by looking how much water is going through there. And so one way to measure the flow is with something called a broad-crested weir. And what a broad-crested weir is, if you have a channel, so water's flowing through a stream, you can just put an obstacle in that stream. Like if it's an engineered structure, like an engineered concrete structure, you could put in a big concrete barrier that the water has to flow over. And as the water flows over that barrier, then it goes through something called critical flow over the top of the barrier, which is associated with the minimum amount of energy required to overcome that obstacle. And the main idea is that you can use the equations of a broad crested weir to find out what's the flow rate, Q. Now you don't need to copy down these equations because you're not actually going to be using them. I just wanted to set the stage for a different type of weir that we are going to do some calculations with. And the reason why we want to talk about this other type of weir is there are some disadvantages to a broad crested weir. Um, if you have an obstacle in the channel, then what happens is that trash and debris can accumulate upstream of that obstruction. And so imagine that you just drop a big concrete barrier, the full width of a channel, and the water's pooling to get up over that barrier, but logs and uh, rocks and sediment, all of that can accumulate upstream. And so they can require a lot of maintenance, and because of that, if they're not properly maintained, they may not be as accurate as we'd like. So, um, some time ago, about 100 years ago, uh, they decided that maybe instead of a broad-crested weir, which is a contraction by raising the height of the bottom of the channel, uh, the idea was, what if instead of reducing the cross-sectional by raising the bottom, what if instead we choke the flow sideways? And that's a flume. A flume is also a, a flow measuring device that's used to try and overcome the disadvantage of sediment and trash accumulating upstream. So we use this flume. I'm going to show you some, uh, a video and some pictures of a flume. But we use it to, uh, to measure the flow. And the flume avoids the sediment deposition. And the other advantage is that water can go over uh, the flume without losing as much energy. And, uh, and sometimes in really flat areas where there's not a lot of slope to the channel, you can't uh, afford a lot of energy loss in the, in the flow. So reduced head loss is a nice advantage as well. So let's look at some, a, a brief video that illustrates a flume. I have to uh, pause my recording here or else YouTube will kill it. All right. Um, so here is a, uh, a side view of the flume 
and some of the uh, labels for the throat in particular is an important section because usually the calibration of uh, the, you know the equation that, that defines what depth goes along with which flow rate is based on the width of the throat and so the width would be along the bottom here uh, where the channel is flat even though it tapers up sideways at an angle when we talk about the throat width we're talking about how wide is the channel at the bottom um, here is a figure that comes from the text that shows an upstream depth as the water is approaching the throat and then we measure the downstream depth in the throat to find out if the uh, if the hydraulic jump is submerged so the equations that we've got here all these different equations are based on the depth in the converging section so the converging section is uh, if we go back to the side view here the converging section is downhill it's really steep and it's trying to get enough uh, velocity to induce that hydraulic jump um, the equations that we have here you can see are calibrated to a certain throat width and these are just kind of typical um, partial flume sizes and it, there's a range of capacities that's overlapping and so to find out how big of a partial flume would be appropriate for a certain drainage canal or channel you'd have to have a rough idea of typically how much water would be going through there but um, we'll take a look at a calculation example here in a minute that gives us a chance to go through and use these equations now these are the free flow equations though these equations are how much water Q it's going to be in terms of cubic meters per second how much water is going through the flume for a certain water depth assuming that the hydraulic jump isn't being interfered with if the water is being interfered with then we have to make a correction and the way we determine whether the hydraulic jump is free flowing or if it's submerged is with the submergence criteria and so depending on what the width of the flume is we have a certain limit of the ratio of the depths so the ratio of the upstream depth uh, versus the downstream depth is what tells you uh, whether the flow is submerged and so if it's any greater than these limits that are shown then that means you have to make a correction and the way the correction is applied is that there are correction tables for each flume and so e the manufacturer typically these flumes are um, they may be precast concrete flumes or sometimes they're just made out of plastic or like an acrylic and they can be put into place you know brought in in a truck and they're used a lot in agriculture so that farmers can find out how much water is going into their fields um, whoever engineered or, or is selling the the flume would generally give you this equation and they'd also give you a, a correction table that shows what is the uh, percentage of submergence and uh, how much of a flow rate correction comes from that so the formula the delta Q that you use is the correction amount multiplied by a correction factor and I know this is starting to get pretty complicated but it's really only a three-step process and we'll go through each of those three steps in an example here in a minute the way it basically works is you calculate what would be the flow rate if it was um, unobstructed flow so you get some baseline flow rate and then in step two you find out the correction amount from this table and then depending on the width of your flume you may have to multiply it by a correction factor now that correction factor is only applied if you don't happen to have the figure for your particular throat width and so this figure is for a throat width of 0.3 meters but if you wanted to try and apply this data to a larger uh, flume you'd have to use one of these correction factors but you may have this figure for a particular throat width and then the correction factor would be one and you just use the correction amount so 
Uh, let's use an example just to make things specific. And so you get some practice before you have to do a homework assignment on this. Uh, let me bring the lights back up. Okay, let's consider the case that we have a flume where the throat width is 0.61 meters. Now, I've already brought that equation up on the screen. Here's the equation for a partial flume with the throw width of 0.61 meters. What we know is that the depth in the converging section is uh, 0.45 meters, and the depth in the throat is 0.39 meters. And you can see from the top figure that the converging section depth is what we call H sub A, and then the throat section is what we call H sub B. So what I'd like you to do is first of all address this question, is the hydraulic jump submerged? And so uh, there in the notes you can quickly make a note of H sub A and H sub B and then we'll go to the submergence criteria table in just a second. So on this one we have H sub A is 0 0.45 and uh, H sub B is 0 0.39. Now if we go back to this earlier table, here's the submergence criteria. Though, so this is the check to see is the hydraulic jump going to be submerged. And our throat width, remember, W on this example is 0 0.61 meters. Okay, so for a a flume with a 0.61, that puts us into the category of, uh, of here. Oops. OK. So the limit is 0.7. So let's check and see what is our ratio of HB divided by HA. So it's 0 0.39 divided by 0 0.45. How many of you have calculators today? If you don't have a calculator, you can always use your phone this once, you know. But we'll, you, we'll have some calculations during most class periods, and so please get in the habit of bringing a calculator. I try and give you at least a taste of the, the problems that you'll have to be solving in the homework, just to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so what's our ratio? Anybody calculate that yet? Good, 0.866. And so that is greater than our limit. Our limit says it can only go up to 0.7 or else the jump is going to be submerged. And so our little conclusion here is yes, the jump is submerged. So what that means is when we're solving for the flow rate, we first find the free flow capacity and then we'll have to subtract out some correction factor. So we'll reduce the amount of water that can make its way through the flume if the downstream depth is interfering with the, with the jump. So now I'm going to stop talking and let you practice using this equation. So first, find the Q free flow using the, uh, the formula that's on the screen there. And then what we'll have to do is we'll calculate the, uh, the delta Q. The delta Q will be the correction amount, amount multiplied by the factor. And that's on a previous slide. So uh, everybody has this equation already from the notes. So I'll go back to the uh, correction factor. And in this example, we are working with a, a width of 0.61. So that correction factor we're going to use will be 1.8. OK, I'm going to pause and let you uh, work for a moment. And then we'll start things back up and make sure we're on the same page. I've got the solution here, so I can circulate around. And if you want to check your work, I'll be able to uh, let you know if you're headed in the right direction.
I, I break it up into several steps because I'm worried I'm going to make a mistake if I do it in just a single step. So this is the free flow capacity, substituting in the, the width of the throat and the upstream depth, H sub A. So let me give you a moment to check that. All right, so we have this free flow capacity. Let me write it on the board here, 0 0.4151 cubic meters per second. And that's what, that would be, you know, based on this particular flume, which has been calibrated by the manufacturer. Uh, for this flume, and for a certain width, and for the depth we measured, that's how much they say the flow rate's going to be, going through it. But there's too much water, uh, too much tail water as it's called. That means the water downstream of the jump is backing up and so it's, it's drowning the hydraulic jump. So it's going to actually be less than that. Now the 1.8 comes from this correction factor. So this table uh, is based on the fact that we only have a figure. This is how much correction is required if you have a flume with a throat width of 0.3. But our flume actually has the width of 0.61. And so if we multiply 1.8 by the correction amount, then we can still use this table. All right, so let's try and use that table. Uh, in our case, like I mentioned just a moment ago, we have the ratio, uh, well, we have the upper head depth is the H sub A of 0.45. And I'll point out, look at this scale. It's not linear. And so if you look at 0.1 and 0.2, there's a big distance between them. But then the next increase of 0.3 is not quite as far away. So this is a logarithmic scale. And that means we have to be a little bit careful about where we put the location for 0.45. So what we're looking at is 0.45 meters. So it's not going to be that 0.5 is halfway between them. You know, it's a little bit higher than the midway point for 0.5, which means that down here is where 0.45 would be. So it's a little tricky. Okay, so now we go sideways and the percent submergence. And so what is our ratio of HB to HA? Yeah, good. It's this 0.866 that we had already calculated to check whether it was uh, submerged. And so percent submergence. So here's 76, 80, 84, 86. We go and we find where would the 86.6 be. So here's the 86% curve. And 86 and a little bit more than that. I wonder if I have the wrong curve here. 86, I may have intercepted the wrong curve. Because uh, I think this is the 86 curve. So maybe I'm a little to the right of it. I'm not all the way to the 90. Uh, this is the 88 curve. So I'm in between. 86.6 is maybe 87. OK, so we go down. And what that says is that the correction is going to be more than 0 0.04, but less than 0 0.06. And again, this is kind of a nonlinear um, scaling on the horizontal axis. So we have to, again, be careful. And what I read that as was I read that that correction amount would be 0 0.044 cubic meters per second. And so over here, if, if the uh, correction amount is 0 0.044 cubic meters per second, then you have to multiply the factor of 1.8 by the correction amount. And so the overall correction is going to be 0 0.0792 cubic meters per second. And then our final flow rate, the corrected amount, is the free flow minus the delta Q. So you'll need to uh, repeat that same process on the homework assignment for problem one and problem two. Problem two is a little bit open-ended because you're going to have to choose which partial flume is appropriate. And so in problem one, I just tell you which partial flume it is. But in 
And part two, there's a little bit of design thrown in there as well as analysis. Uh, that's designed on the homework. That's design two needs uh, us to have a software? No. Problem one and problem two, you only just uh, do hand calculations. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I think uh, what we've gone over today, I think, will give you enough of a head start that you'll be able to, to figure out how to do one and two. Of course, if you have problems uh, or questions, then I'm happy to go over it. All right, we've been going for an hour. I think we'll probably, each class period, try and take a short break just so you can stretch your legs, you get a drink of water about the midpoint. This is a good time for that. So right now it's 5. Let's get back together at 5.05, .05 and then we'll uh, cover the second half of our lecture, which is about culverts. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about culverts. A, uh, a culvert is designed to pass water at the intersection of a stream and a road. And uh, you can do the same thing with a bridge. I mean, water goes under a roadway with a bridge, but bridges are pretty expensive. And so the cheaper way to handle uh, the crossing of a stream and a roadway is with a culvert. And how big the culvert is going to be uh, depends on the flow rate. And so the, uh, the flow rate that's going through a culvert um, is like its capacity depends on how big the opening is, how long the pipe is, uh, how steep the culvert is installed, what it's made out of, and then also backwater conditions, which means the amount of water uh, downstream of the culvert at its exit. And so here's a picture of some culverts. I took this photo in Colorado. I went out to the mountains of Colorado over the summer. And um, this photo is notable because a lot of people don't like to have multi-barrel cul culverts like this. Uh, what, we're, what we're looking at is we're standing upstream and the water's flowing into the culverts downstream. And so we're um, the water hasn't yet gone through the culverts here. And the reason why multi-barrel culverts like this, where there's more than a single pipe, are sometimes looked down upon is that if you think about a big branch or a big log that's floating down the river, then it could become wedged upstream of those openings. And so it could kind of like start to uh, accumulate trash and trap other debris. But I didn't notice that here or at a couple of other locations where I saw a multi-barrel culvert as well. Uh, at least in Colorado, I think they have less of a problem with debris than we do. Are those culverts uh, metal or cement? These are metal. Yeah, this is corrugated steel. Uh, usually what they do is they take steel and they'll dip it in zinc uh, so that they're galvanizing it. Um, and these galvanized uh, steel culverts, if they're installed correctly and there isn't uh, like acidic mine drainage, you know, if it's just ordinary water and they're maintained well, they can last up to 50 years and maybe even beyond. So like, there's a few, the three is showing the picture, but mostly it's dependent on the rate of the river. Uh, the tree in the background here? No, no, I'm talking about this color, three one. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mostly it depends on the width of the river, how the width is, yeah. and how much it can handle the water. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. I think in this case, what they decided is they would put in these three different pipes because the road is pretty low. You'll notice that there's very little cover on top, like the amount of soil between the top of the pipe and the road is mainly only about well, maybe one foot. 18 inches, it's very little cover. And so uh, they couldn't have one big pipe because then it would take the road too high. Sometimes they do have arch-shaped culverts, and we'll look at some other examples of culverts. This is the downstream end of that same uh, culvert system. You can see that the water comes out of the pipe and it plunges down into a pool, and so it's not submerged, and that allows the water to flow through the culvert freely. Um, without any uh, tailwater effects. This is a box culvert that's made out of reinforced concrete. And the advantage of a culvert like this 
compared to these flexible pipes is that these flexible pipes have load limits on how heavy a truck is that could be going over the, the pipes, whereas uh, a concrete structure like this is going to have a much higher limit. Uh, you'll also notice that what these have are these wing walls on the side that kind of guide the flow into the entrance of the culvert. And so it holds the soil back and prevents scour of this soil as the water is flowing in the direction of uh, underneath the culvert. So we're going to go through a, a demonstration of how you can calculate the flow capacity, like how much water can make it through a culvert of a certain size. Just a couple more pictures of culverts. Sometimes the bottom of the culvert is concrete, and sometimes it's just left to be a natural channel. Like if there's already a creek in a location, then what you can do is just build a structure over the creek, and then the soil and the roadway um, goes on top of the culvert. Now, um, this is a pretty large culvert that's going under a, a wide highway. And the reason why I include this picture is it shows that the bottom of the channel has become kind of eroded and damaged over time. And so we can analyze a culvert at the beginning of its life using the assumptions that it's smooth concrete and that it's been uh, you know, uh, correctly installed. But in 30 or 40 or 50 years, um, fast moving water can scour the bottom of the culvert. So it may behave a little bit differently from a hydraulic standpoint after some years than at the beginning if the, uh, if the rock is scoured out or if there's damage to the culvert. OK, so it's a metal, concrete, or plastic, or even wooden conduit that surface water flows under a roadway. And they're used because bridges are expensive. And they're usually utilized for much lower flow rates, where a bridge isn't justified. Um, now, how to decide the size that's needed for a culvert uh, there's a relationship between hydrology and hydrologic engineering and then the hydraulic sizing. The data that you'd need to, uh, to size a culvert is the flow rate and how often a certain flow rate is coming through. Today we'll just have that as a given, but through the rest of the semester our whole objective is to find out how much water is coming out of the watershed. But let's just take, for instance, the assumption that maybe someone did the analysis and what they said is that every 25 years there's going to be a storm that causes a flow rate of 25 cubic meters per second. So what we'd need to do is find out how big should the pipe be to accommodate this flow rate of 25 cubic meters per second. Now there's a lot of different factors that influence uh, how that culvert's going to behave. Like I mentioned before, it's the opening size the slope of the culvert, how rough the pipe is, uh, what the, uh, the, the downstream depth of the water. So there's a lot of these conditions that are all going to be kind of accounted for um, by the program. And here are some uh, images that illustrate different uh, inlet configurations. Maybe in a very simple example, you can have the pipe that's just sticking out of soil. But the problem with this, if you have a projecting barrel, is that the water can approach at a high velocity. And that erosion could uh, undermine the integrity of the pipe. So if the water is moving past the soil very quickly and scrapes the soil away, then that maybe would cause a failure of the road that's above the culvert. So to prevent that, sometimes they'll cast in place some concrete walls around the opening of a culvert. So you can see. There's a head wall, which is uh, in direct contact with the opening of the barrel. And then the wing walls come out at an angle to both guide the flow into the pipe and also to uh, protect the soil that is supporting the road that's above. And so remember, the whole point of this pipe is that we want to put a road over a stream. And so not pictured is that on top of this culvert, there's going to be some gravel, um, asphalt, 
and all the typical striping that you'd see for a roadway. So there's a variety of different ways to uh, have a pipe. You can maybe miter the, uh, the pipe to this slope and that provides some hydraulic advantages, maybe a little bit extra capacity if you uh, miter the pipe like that, uh, less likely to accumulate trash and sediment. And um, the, uh, the stakes of sizing, sizing a culvert incorrectly are pretty high. And this is a series of images that was taken when, let me set the scene for you. There was water going through a river, and there's the water depth upstream got very high. And so the water started seeping through the soil around the culvert, uh, rather than all of it going through the culvert. Now, water still was going through the culvert, but the culvert was too small, and the water upstream started to accumulate. So in other words, this road started acting like a dam, and there was seepage through the soil, so it scoured the water downstream and the culvert's integrity was completely compromised. And this is the uh, condition of the roadway uh, after, you know, essentially all of, the, all of the soil that was supporting the roadway got washed downstream. And, you know, water kind of has a mind of its own. You never want to underestimate the, uh, the force of moving water. So this is what we want to avoid when we're sizing a culvert. We want to make sure that the water upstream doesn't get too deep because then it can cause the uh, seepage that threatens the integrity of the culvert. All right. Now I already mentioned that there's a variety of factors that can affect how much water goes through the culvert. And the reports that we'll look at in this software will sometimes tell us uh, what factors are dominating, whether it's uh, inlet control. So inlet control is the case where the size of the opening affects how much water can get through the culvert. Uh, this is illustrating a hydraulic jump inside of the pipe. These are different flow conditions that can happen inside of the culvert. Now what we're looking at right now is a side view. Of course the uh, the roadway is on the top of this trapezoidal shape and they have these side slopes just because soil naturally slumps downward. And so the roadway surface is on the top and we're looking at some pipe that's going underneath the roadway to connect the uh, channel upstream and downstream. Uh, so these are different inlet control conditions and in the background the computer is uh, alternating between the equations that describe how the flow performs, whether the uh, water is fully submerging the opening whether there's full submergence at the opening and the exit. So now if you compare these, this case C and case D, you'll notice that in case D, not only is there this ventilation drain, but then there's also the headwater and the tailwater are completely submerging the inlet and the outlet. Uh, and so they put in that drain to try and prevent there being any kind of uh, suction pressure inside the pipe when both the inlet and the outlet are uh, fully submerged. So outlet control, you can see a variety of conditions where it's not the size of the opening that governs how much water gets through there, but sometimes it's what's going on in the channel downstream. And I show you this, uh, this figure, it's a nomograph, which is how culvert problems used to be solved before the software was widespread and easy to use there would actually be books full of tables like this and to figure out how big the culvert would need to be you would connect two of these lines and solve for the third and so for instance if you knew what the flow rate was going to be so the discharge is this middle line and if you knew how big the culvert was then you'd connect two points on these lines and you draw a line extending through and then this would tell you how deep the water is going to be through the culvert. So for a 42 inch diameter culvert, and it looks like in this example it's about 120 cubic feet per second. So for those conditions then the water depth inside the culvert is about, uh, for condition one, two and a half feet. So 
Uh, nomographs were a little bit tricky to use, but luckily now we have the software that um, makes the design and repeated analysis a lot easier. These are just to illustrate how big sometimes culverts get. These are some culverts uh, that I encountered when I was uh, living over in the United Arab Emirates. I used to live in Dubai, and uh, this is a really large culvert. And you may think that a, you know, in a desert like the UAE, they wouldn't have hydrology or rainfall as a consideration, but they get enough water out of the canyons in the UAE that they have to put in really large culverts. And what I'll point out is that they have like a chain link armoring on the, uh, on the slopes to try and prevent scour. So they're, they're worried that the flows may even be so high that these culverts aren't able to accommodate all of the water. And when there's too much flow, sometimes it can go over the top of the roadway. You know, like if, if there's just more water that can go through these pipes, then the water goes over the roadway as well. And so that's why they have um, this chain link holding the rocks down is so that if they have overtopping, as it's called, then these rocks aren't going to be washed away and the road isn't ruined. So they've really spent a lot of money making this culvert pretty nice. Sometimes we don't have the same amount of money. Uh, you do what you can to keep a culvert in service. You can see here they've used some old road signs to try and uh, keep this soil from caving into the channel. So I thought that's kind of a funny picture of a culvert. Okay, so the software that we're going to use is called HY8. And it's free because it's made and published by the uh, the US government, the Federal Highways Administration. Frankly, I'm surprised that their website's still working. During the government shutdown, it seems like they uh, will usually shut down a lot of their software. I'm not joking. I mean, there are other websites that I've needed to use during government shutdowns before, and just the websites got switched off. But so uh, what we need to get is HY8 version 7.5. And so if you've got your PC today, is that just one person who's got a PC today? Oh, that's too bad. All right, you got, you got the Apple. It's nice, but all right. Um, so today will be a demo. And the, the good news is that, remember, this lecture is being recorded. And so anything that's on the screen, you can go back and watch again when you're trying to figure out how to do this for the homework assignment. My suggestion is, once you get the software installed on your computer, work through these examples you're on your own, um, maybe with the, uh, the video playing in the side to just remind you how to do it. Um, so this software we're going to use to look at three examples tonight. Now I'm going to show you a couple of different views of a roadway going over a stream. I hope it's obvious that the roadway is, here's the road, you can see the, the yellow dot, uh, the yellow line, the blue is the stream, and this is a top view. And what we want to do is we want to analyze what's happening when there's 25 cubic meters going through this stream. And what we expect that the maximum ever to see would be 30 cubic meters. So we'll actually analyze what's happening at both of these flow rates. We'll take a look at when the water is 25 and when it's 30, what's happening with this crossing. Some of the other dimensions that are important on this uh, sketch are the uh, width of the channel. So you see where it says 5 meters. That's how wide the river is. Now N, some of you maybe don't have a background in, uh, in hydraulics and that's fine. N is a roughness factor. And it tells you how, uh, how rough is the bottom of this channel. And so you can probably just intuitively imagine that if, if you had like big boulders and a really jagged cobble, that the flow characteristics are going to be different than if it's like a nice smooth paved concrete. Like a nice smooth concrete is going to have less energy loss. And so the water is going to flow through that channel differently than if it's really rough. So this N value would be kind of in between. It's not super smooth, but it's not extraordinarily rough. And this will always just be given in the assignments. 
Yeah. I was just going to ask, like, how high or low can that end value be? Is there um, to yeah, the lowest you'd see for an end value is typically 0 0.012 for like a smooth concrete. And then the highest you'd maybe see would be 0.1 for a really rough uh, channel. So there is tables in the textbook that tells you, it gives like a description. You know, if it's clay soil, what end value to use? Or, you know, if it's gravel of a certain diameter, which end value to use? And so uh, picking the end value is a little bit of an art, and it's a little bit, you know, the consulting handbooks and references that will guide you in the right direction. Now, a couple of other things that I've detailed here is, see where it says roadway station? That's just how HY8 um, describes the length of things, is, is by station. And um, it's, it's nothing fancy, it's just that sometimes roadway plans, like they describe how long a road is in terms of stationing. And so I think that's why the HY8 follows the same approach. I think it'll make sense to you in just a minute when we start uh, putting this into an example. Now this was the top view, here's the side view. So what we've done is if we draw, if we cut this in half, and now we want to look at it sideways. So we want to uh, have, this is the upstream channel, here's the downstream channel, and what we've done is, is we like essentially think about if you took a knife and you cut the culvert long way so that we can get a side view of what's happening with it. In this cross-sectional view, um, we can see what is the elevation of the roadway. It's at an elevation of uh, 307 meters. We see what's the elevation of the uh, channel. So the bottom of the channel matches up to the bottom of the culvert. They both have an elevation of 300 meters. But then downstream, it's a little bit lower. You know, this, this river and also the culvert is going downhill. And so what this asks is, uh, would a 24-inch culvert be OK? Now what we're going to do is we're going to put all of this information into the, uh, into the program. And we're going to try and find out, is the water going to get too high? You know, will the water go over the top of the roadway if we put in a 24-inch culvert? And 24-inch culvert, by the way, that's 610 millimeters. Now the program will allow you to do calculations either in traditional units or in SI units. And which to use kind of just depends on what is most of your data in. And you can see that most of our data is in, in the SI. So we're going to check uh, culvert diameter of uh, 610 millimeters. So is that OK? Let's analyze that. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up the HY8 program. And um, I'm going to, I wish that was a little bit bigger. You may want to, if you have trouble seeing this small text, you may want to scoot forward because uh, That is awfully small. All right, we're going to create a new project and add a crossing. A crossing just means a location where a pipe is going into a stream. So remember this picture from Colorado. Here's a roadway, and there's a crossing there. It's the intersection of a roadway and a, and a channel together. OK, so we just say continue. And it automatically takes you into where you can enter the data for this particular culvert in question. All right. So in our case, let me go back to the, the description. I'm going to show you how to translate a problem statement into what you need to put into the program. So the first thing, we'll just start at the, on the left side and work our way down, and then come over to the right side and work our way down. OK, so the first thing, the discharge data. And we're going to look at the minimum, the design flow, and the maximum. So just to start off with, uh, oh, CFS. So I need to cancel out of this, and I need to change it from US customary units 
to metric. Yeah. All right. So I may need to start over. All right. Uh, metric. And then let's put in a new culvert crossing. Okay. So that's this window where I'm putting in the data. Now you can see the units are CMS, which is cubic meters per second. All right. So the minimum flow, we'll just have it start at zero. And in this earlier screen, it said the design flow is 25 and the maximum is 30. So let me put in the 25 and the 30 here. So 25 cubic meters per second and 30 cubic meters per second. All right, tailwater data. Now that's asking on the downstream end, so the water, th this red arrow shows us the direction of flow. The water's flowing from upstream to downstream. Uh, upstream is called headwater. Downstream is called tailwater. So we have a rectangular channel. So what that means is that the channel looks like this. It's rectangular. And from this top view, we can see that the width is 5 meters. 5 meters is the width. So if we go back here to the problem statement, all right, the bottom width is 5 meters. Now the channel slope, we can also get from this drawing, S0 means that's the slope of the channel. And what it means is um, for every meter downstream we go, it's 0 0.0026 meters lower. And so it's telling you how steep is the river. And this one's not very steep. It's less than a 1% slope. So we can just type that S0 into the program. So the channel slope is 0 0.0025. OK, and the Manning's N, this is the roughness value. And it depends on what, what that channel is made out of. In our case, it's just given. So we'll type in 0 0.05 for the N. And now channel invert elevation for the tailwater. Let's go back to this side view. The invert elevation is it saying, what is the elevation of the river that matches up to downstream of the culvert? Remember that photo I showed you in Colorado that in that example, out in the mountains of Colorado, they didn't match. Because in this example, you notice that the bottom of the pipe is above the bottom of the channel. So the water is like dumping into the river. Our example is a little more simple than that. In our example that we're working just now, we have a match between the outlet of the culvert and the elevation of the channel. So I'm 299.95 is what I'm going to put in here for the channel invert. 299.95 meters. OK, now I've put that in. If I want, I can click View, and it'll tell me this rating curve. It basically says, for a certain flow rate, how deep the water is going to be in the channel downstream. But we don't necessarily have to look at that or do anything with it. It's just in the back of the computer, like in the, the computer's memory, it knows how deep the water is going to be in the river downstream, depending on the flow rate. Now it needs to know some information about the roadway. And so we have a constant roadway elevation. Um, the other option besides a constant roadway elevation would be like it in a sag. Sometimes a, uh, a road will be going down, and then the culvert would be put in um, and then the road goes back up again. And so sometimes if the water was going to be getting higher than the culvert, it would be going across a sag like this. But in our case, um, it's just a constant elevation. What we're assuming is that this road is the same height everywhere as it goes uh, in this vicinity. And so we're going to leave it on constant roadway elevation. And in your homework, it's the same. You, you don't have any cases where you need to change it from constant roadway elevation. Um, first roadway station, this isn't something that it actually calculates anything with. But since we've got the data, we're going to say it's 5 plus 0, 0 
to the first roadway station. Oh, I'm sorry, 500. Uh, the crest length, that's asking um, if the water starts to flow over the top of the road, how long is it encountering? And so it's the same in this case, since it's a rectangular cross section. Like if the water starts to flow over the road, then it's five meters that it's in contact with the road. So our crest um, elevation and length are going to be related to that. And so the length is five meters. And then the elevation of the crest is 307. That's how high the water has to get before it starts to flow over the road. 307. And it's paved with asphalt. And the top width is related to how many lanes of traffic we have. Um, you know, we've got two lanes of traffic here from the inlet and the outlet station. It looks like that the asphalt goes most of the way of that culvert length. And so we're going to put down that there's 20 meters of roadway width because that's what this is, is this is the width of the roadway, that black line on top. Okay, so top width, 20 meters. Okay, the last thing that we need to do is put in culvert data. Before we start doing that, any questions so far with the data that we put in? All right, now we are analyzing a circular concrete pipe with a conventional outlet. Okay, so it's Culvert 1 is circular. Now there's other shapes available. Circular is the default selection. Concrete, there's other material types. We could have uh, corrugated steel, plastic. Ours is made out of concrete. The diameter, to check a 24 inch, we need to put the diameter in terms of millimeters. And so converting between the two, 610 millimeters. Embedment depth you can leave uh, empty. That's just talking about uh, the location of the pipe, how deep into the, uh, in the roadway fill it goes. Uh, the default N value, this N that it's asking about, is related to the material. And so if we change from concrete to corrugated steel, you'll notice that suddenly that end value automatically changes. So it, it has a default assumption for what's the roughness of what the pipe is made out of. So if I go back to concrete, then it has the end value of 0.012. I, I do need to type in that 610 again, though, because I lost that. All right, uh, the culvert is straight. It's not going at an angle, which would slightly affect the hydraulics. and. We can leave all of these default assumptions, square edge with head wall, no inlet depression. And you can look over what those other options are, but they have a relatively minor effect on the hydraulic capacity of the culvert. This site data, though, is, is important for us to get right. Um, because this is going to say um, how long the culvert is. If you think about what we've told it so far, we've told it how high is the road, how wide is the road? How wide is the river? But we didn't yet tell it how long is that concrete pipe. And that's where we, we do that here in the site data. We tell it, now if you look, our concrete pipe is 20 meters. And we know that from the inlet station and the outlet station. Okay, so the inlet station, 100. Outlet station, 120. It's going to use the difference between the two to know the length of the pipe. And the other thing we have to tell it is the elevation of the inlet and the outlet. And so the pipe, the bottom of the pipe, which is called the invert, that means the bottom of the pipe, is at 300. And then downstream, the outlet invert, 299.95. Okay, so 300 and 299.95. Okay, so I've got all this typed in, and if I click on OK, and I want to see what's going on, you can see this is the water level above the roadway 
when the discharge is 25 CFS, uh, cubic meters per second. So the fact that this blue line is above the roadway, you know, our roadway elevation was 307 meters, that tells you that actually that pipe's too small. The water level is getting so high that it's going to flow over the top of the road, which is what we don't want. We, we can't deal with overtopping. So the first question that got asked was, uh, is a 24-inch diameter culvert okay? No. no, it's not. We have to make that pipe bigger if we want it to work. Um, now, we can click Analyze. And you'll notice now here is a tabular summary of what's going on with the culvert. And it tells you for a certain headwater elevation, so how deep is the water getting upstream associated with a certain flow rate. So what's our limit? 307. If the water goes above 307, then the water's going over the road and people can't drive. Maybe it will damage the roadway. So what we want to make sure is we want the flow, when we have the 25 cubic meters per second, we want the flow to be less than an elevation of 307. So what you can see in this table is at 25 cubic meters per second, the depth is 308. And 307 is our limit. In fact, here it tells you what's happening when the water level is up to 307, it only takes 2 cubic meters per second to get the water up that high. So this, uh, this pipe idea of 24 inches, that's drastically undersized. Like this is a huge problem. So what we can do, the nice thing about uh, this program is that you can iterate really quickly. You can make a change, analyze it, see what's happening. And so we were using 610 millimeters. Well, let's try 1500 millimeters. Analyze crossing. Okay, so now we can get 11.8 cubic meters per second when the water is up to 307. We want to keep making it big enough so that we can get 25 cubic meters per second through the pipe before there's any overtopping. So we're not there yet. 1500 millimeters, it's not big enough. Double click on this. What if we make the uh, diameter of the culvert 2 meters? Would a 2 meter diameter culvert work? So we again analyze the crossing. We're getting awfully close because now that we've made it 2 meters in diameter then uh, we can get 20 cubic meters per second through there. Well, let's try this. Instead of just making it larger and larger and larger, we could put in another barrel. See down here at the bottom it says number of barrels. In Colorado there was three. Well, let's try what if we have two barrels that are each 1,500? Because we're getting so tall, we may not be able to fit the culvert if we get too tall. So let's have in two 1500 millimeter diameter barrels, analyze the crossing. Now we're getting really close because we're getting 22.5 cubic meters per second. And so this design process is basically optimization. It's this process of iteration going over and over and over. We want to find out what's the minimum size you can get away with. Because obviously, you know, like if I say 3000 millimeters, analyze crossing, well, everything's fine now. You'd have to get up to 45 cubic meters per second before there's overtopping. But engineering design is supposed to be like just barely satisfy the criteria because that's what's going to be the solution that costs the least. And you want to have the most efficient design that just barely satisfies the demands. And so um, in design, what, what you do, you know, like if you were actually building this for a client, is you'd find out the minimum size maybe it's 1600 millimeters. The minimum size that's going to be acceptable. We're awfully close now, 2479. So I think we might be able to nail it on this last one. If we make it 1650, analyze the crossing, then yeah, that's big enough. But that's not two barrels. That's with two barrels. Each of them is 1650. So what if we leave it at 16 and make it three barrels? Okay, good question. Yeah, if if we make it three barrels, then that's going to give us plenty of capacity. We could make it even smaller. So the question is, like, what's the best design? Um, you know, maybe these large pipes have to be more thick, and it becomes very expensive. 
So sometimes if you're weighing the costs, it's better to have many small pipes than a few big ones. So probably, my guess is if we have three barrels, we might even wait, be able to get away with like 1,200. Maybe a little bit bigger. But you get the idea, right? Yes? So like mountainous areas like Colorado, when you have to deal with like the seasonal changes from mm -hmm. the snow melt, yeah. how do you like calculate for that? Or do you have like extra culverts just in case like, you know, spring comes around and there's mm -hmm. going to be some chances of flooding? Well, um, the good thing about snow melt is that it's usually a really slow process. Compared to a rainfall event, um, the rainfall is usually the most flashy thing that, that you'll see. The, the exception to that is if it gets warm really quickly. So if you have a hot flash and there's a lot more snow melt and then it also rains. So if it's warm and rainy, then um, you know, that, that does go into the analysis. The, 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 all we've done today is we just say, well, there is some flow rate that we're designing for. But how did they come up with that flow rate? You know, maybe that was the combination of accounting for snow melt and also looking at what the watershed will do for a certain size rainfall event. Yeah, so you do need to put in some extra capacity in there because there's uh, an infinite number of ways things can go wrong. Did you have a question as well? Yeah, like the flood, I have a lot of the range. Like the flow is more than the color. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the flow rate could be so much higher, um, you know, if, if you, Colorado's relatively dry, you know, they in the mountains would maybe only get uh, like 20 or 30 inches of rainfall per year, but there are some places like Hawaii, the, the windward side of Hawaii has, is mountainous and also it's getting more than 60 inches of rain per year. So you have to know precisely like what are the weather conditions where you're planning to build the culvert. Uh, are there any questions about how we use the program for this first example? Now, if I'm not mistaken, we can go until 6.20. Is that right? 6.20 is our kill time. So we've got about a half hour to get through uh, these other two examples. Um, the, the main one I want to make sure that we do is this example two, because example three is just optimizing, which you already saw in the first one. All right, so this is a different case where now what we have is uh, we want to find out for this culvert that we're just looking at the side view, what flow rate will cause the headwater to be a depth of two when the channel is five meters wide. And then if we change the downstream, so if we change the width, what would cause the tailwater to be two meters for this flow rate. So we're going to solve this in steps one at a time. OK. Um, we don't have a top view, but let me sketch one on the whiteboard. Um, here's the stream. Maybe I should do the stream in blue. Here's the stream. And again, just for simplicity, we're assuming that we have a, a rectangular channel. And uh, the channel width is 5 meters. So 5 meters is this distance, which means we've got that same rectangular channel like this. 5 meters wide, but uh, the culvert is known. We're going to be analyzing this culvert. It's a box, 1.5 meters wide, 1.5 meters tall, and it's made out of concrete that has this end value. We'll have to change the end value, probably overwrite it slightly, because its default may be uh, just a bit lower than that. Uh, this S0, that's talking about the slope of the channel and also the slope of the culvert. But what isn't given is we don't have any elevations. You know, like on the first example, you were given the invert elevation, the uh, outlet invert elevation. You were given the roadway height. We don't have any of those absolute elevations given. 
So we have to kind of just make an assumption and do some calculations along the way. Um, so to do that, let's just set a datum. This marker's no good. Um, let's say uh, here's our culvert. So we're going to have this just by our assumption, this is uh, 100 meters. Now, look, the culvert length is given as um, 40 meters. So what elevation is this going to be for the slope that's given? If we're told that the slope is 0 0.007, then this downstream elevation, like at 2, We'll call it E2. So E1 is 100. E2 is going to be E1 minus the length times the slope. So it's 100 meters is the initial elevation upstream minus the 40 meter length that's right, 0 0.007. All right, so if you've got your calculator, maybe verify my calculations. I'll do it and you check to make sure I'm getting it right. We need to find out what's that downstream slope because it's something we have to type into the program. We have to tell it, like, where is the culvert at which elevation. So 100 minus 40 times 0 0.007. Okay, so we're subtracting 0.28 meters. So that this means that there's an elevation drop of 0 0.28. So the downstream elevation is 99.72. Have I got that right? Yeah. Okay, 99.72 meters. Okay, that's our downstream elevation. Now, the length of the culvert is just, they tell you directly, it's 40 meters. But remember, in the previous example, how we defined the length of the culvert, we define the length of the culvert with like inlet station, outlet station. So let's just call this inlet station, let's call it the, the station is 0 plus 0, 0, and then the outlet station is going to be 0 plus 40. Um, let, let's... So we're using the length? That's the length of the uh, the length of the pipe. Yep. I'm going to start a new crossing here. I'm going to cancel this and do a new one. I don't need to save the existing file. Okay. And uh, again, we're in traditional. I'm sorry, SI unit. So I want to go to metric and new culvert crossing. Okay. So this is example two. Let's put in, before we put in the, the discharge data, we'll put in um, the, uh, the tailwater stuff. The channel width is 5 meters, so it's a rectangular channel. The bottom width is 5 meters, and the slope of the channel is 0 0.007. In this case, the, the channel slope matches the culvert slope. 0 0.007. Okay. What is the channel made out of? Whatever it is, the roughness is 0 0.05. So we'll put in that Manning's roughness of the channel. And now the channel invert elevation. That's the one that we just calculated. That's both the elevation of the downstream end of the pipe and the elevation of the channel. So 99.72 is what we put in for that. 99.72 is the channel invert elevation. Okay, now let's look at what we know about the road. We don't really have any information about the road other than, you know, it's up on top of that culvert and um, the, the crest length is going to be 5 meters, so if the water is going to flow over the top of the road, the crest 
length is five meters. Since it's a rectangular channel, the bottom width is the same as the top width. And um, let's assume that the road is the full length of the culvert. So we're going to put it the roadway width is 40 meters because it doesn't show like any tapering in this case. It's not like that the, the pipe is longer than the road. In this instance, we'll put in the uh, crest length is 5 meters. The crest elevation. Now, we want to find out um, how high the water is going to get. So we said that this is 100 meters. And so how high is the road above that? Um, headwater of 2 meters is going to be almost to the top. So let's just say that the crest elevation here we're going to analyze what if it's 2.5 meters. We need it to, at the very least, be greater than the headwater we expect to see. Okay, so crest elevation, 102.5. And uh, the top width is 40 meters because the roadway width is the same as the pipe length. Okay, so we have the roadway data in there. Um, it's not circular for this one. It's a concrete box. And the dimensions of the concrete box is 1,500 meters by 1,500 meters. Okay, so 1,500 by 1,500. The Manning's N by default is 0 0.012. Our problem tells us it should be 0 0.013, slightly more rough. We can leave all of this uh, culvert type straight, inlet configuration, depression, leave that in the default values. Now the inlet station is where we remember we define the length of the culvert. So we're going to call this inlet station 0, outlet station 40, inlet elevation 100, outlet elevation 99.72. So now it knows how steep the culvert is. And there's just one barrel. So the last thing we want to do is just put in some flow rates. Because it's, this is asking, find the flow rate that will cause the headwater depth to be 2 meters. So we want to find it. We're going to have to iterate a few times. Um, what flow rate is it that causes the water to rise up 2 meters as it's trying to flow through that culvert that has a box uh, size of 1.5 meter by 1.5. So let's just say, let's go from 0 to 10 cubic meters per second. And we can do 10 as both the maximum and the design flow. So we analyze the crossing, and it tells us that um, to get 10 cubic meters per second through there, there is some overtopping. You know, like if we assume that the water can go up to 2.5, this is saying what flow rate causes the headwater depth to be 2. And so 2 is between 5 and 6 cubic meters per second. In this table, of the discharge is the column on the right. The headwater elevation is the column on the left. So if the, um, the bottom of the channel is 100 meters, the water depth of 2 is like between these points. And so now let's run the analysis again, but from 5 to 6 cubic meters per second. It's sort of like we're zooming in on just that flow range to find out exactly what flow rate was it. So I go back here into the uh, data and I say, Let's go from a minimum of 5 and up to a maximum of 6 and find out how is this culvert behaving. You know, it, it's a system, really. It's a culvert and the stream. So how is this system behaving between 5 and 6 cubic meters per second? So analyze the crossing. And what you can see is that here, 102.01 1 it's at a flow rate of 5.70 cubic meters per second. 
And so we could now answer the question. What they were asking is, how much flow rate will cause the headwater depth to be 2 meters? And so the answer is Q equals 5.70, pretty close, I mean to a hundredth of a meter. So 5.70 cubic meters per second for the headwater depth to rise two meters. Okay. Does everybody follow what we did in that analysis? Whereas in the first example, we were trying to find out how big should the pipe be. In this one, we're just analyzing. We're just saying, how high will the water get for a certain flow rate? Or in other words, when I look at this particular system, Maybe someone was out there with a measuring tape, and they measured that the water depth was 2 meters, and so they want to know what flow rate was that when I saw a certain depth. So it's looking at headwater elevation versus the discharge. All right, so part two of the example says, all right, well, um, if we change the width of the channel, we started off with a channel width of 5 meters, if we change that channel, then what is going to cause the tail water depth to be 2 meters for this flow rate? Um, tail water performance, like the, the channel downstream, you can get from this table. So if you click on View, and we plot this, it's asking, all right, for a certain flow rate that we already found, in our case it's 5.70. Okay, so part two, for Q equals 5.70 cubic meters per second, what width will cause a depth depth equal to two meters? Okay. So we're going to optimize the width of the channel. Now, oh, I did it over a pretty narrow, uh, narrow range. Let's go back to from 0 to 6. Analyze the crossing. OK. So the, uh, the plot of the data here says, um, How deep is the water going to be for a certain wet, uh, width? And so we want the uh, 2 meters of depth at what width of the channel will cause that. Um, so here's our table, and you can see that um, 2 meters above where it starts. So if we're starting at 99.72, we want to find out the elevation of that water is going to be 101.72 meters. So 101.72 is over here. So that discharge is looking like it's less than 2 cubic meters per second. So we have to keep iterating the tailwater curve for changing different widths. So closing this. We could keep changing the, uh, the width of the tail water. Like, what if we made this bottom width, instead of 5 meters wide, what if we only made it 4 meters wide? And then you have it calculate this new one. So what we're looking for is, where is it that the depth is 2 meters for the flow rate 5.70? So here's this table. Um, It's showing us that the width isn't getting very high yet. It's only up to one meter. So we can make the channel even narrower. So let's take the channel. What if we make the channel only three meters wide? OK, so now it's three meters wide. We're compressing the flow into a narrower channel. Now the depth is getting more, but it's still not up to two. So we can 
make the channel maybe only need to have the channel two meters wide. Now we, it seems like we've gone a little too far because what we're looking for is for the flow rate of 5.7 to be e when the depth is exactly two. So I'm going to make two changes here. I'm going to have it go from five to six again and then maybe if we have it be 2.25. Okay, that's getting pretty close because what you can see is that for this flow rate that we were talking about, 5.70, so this first column is the flow rate. What is the depth of the water for that flow rate? Well, the water depth is up to 1.907. So let me ask you, should we make the channel a little bit narrower or should we make it a little bit wider to, to take the depth of the water all the way up to 2? We make it just a little bit narrower. Yeah, a little bit narrower. So if instead of 2.25, what if it's just 2.2? We view that. So now we're getting even closer, 1.956. So that's probably as close as we need to take it. So the answer to this part B is, what is the rectangular width that will cause the tailwater depth to be 2 meters? All right, so what we ended up with was a bottom width of 2.20 meters. So the answer is 2.20 meters. All right, well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we, we only have 10 minutes remaining, and that's probably not enough time to do this third example, but you already had a design question in the, uh, the first illustration we went through. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send out an email that gives you some instructions on how you can download Windows and install it onto your uh, Apple computer if you want to give that a shot. Um, the, uh, the assignment has you do two questions related to these, is it two? Yeah, two questions related to culverts. And if you have any questions, um, I've got a lot of office hours between now and next Wednesday and you know, I know a lot of you will probably be working in the evening and on the weekend. I'll, I'll answer your email whenever I see it. Um, I'll check it through the weekend. So if you will work on this and have any problems, please let me know. Uh, it's the first time you're using HY8, so sometimes even just getting the software installed can be a channel a challenge. Uh, let's finish by taking one last look at these announcements. Okay, so what you need to do is read the book section 5.6.2 to just kind of get some exposure to the content about flumes. Read the book section 16.2.1 about culverts. And then this first homework assignment is due next Wednesday. All right, well, let me know if you have any questions. And other than that, I'll post the link to this video on MU Online so that you can go out and find it on YouTube.